Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Ben Rue, Program, Program Associate here at the Forum on Workplace Inclusion. I'm pleased to have you here today for the December Dilemma, Religion, Resilience, and Mental Health During the Holiday Season with presenters Leslie Funk and Cameron Smith of the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding. This is the eighth webinar of our 2020 Forum on Workplace Inclusion webinar series sponsored by Aon. We hope you enjoy this experience and find the information helpful in your work and join us for future webinars. Today, Leslie and Cameron will be presenting for about 45 minutes with Q&A at the end. Due to recent security issues, the chat will not be open. Please utilize the Q&A feature to ask any questions. There will be polls throughout, so please feel free to participate in those. At the end of this webinar, you will be asked to fill out a brief survey on your experience. Please take a moment to fill out this survey as your feedback helps us shape future webinars we truly appreciate your open and honest feedback. Today's webinar is SHRM and HRCI eligible. The activity IDs will be provided at the end of the webinar. It is also being recorded and will be brought and will be published to our website within the next week. Visit forumworkplaceinclusion.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn for more information. As you may know, the forum is dedicated to providing the very best learning and development programming for diversity, equity, and inclusion education. During regular times, we provide webinars and podcasts on a, on a variety of topics on a monthly basis throughout the year, as well as our flagship conference in the spring. During these virtual times, we are working even harder to present more program for you, including some specific to COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, re recent racial uprising and its impact on our workplaces, ourselves, and especially undeserved, underserved populations. We provide most of our resources like this webinar for free. We're able to do this thanks to the generous support of our community. We know these resources have great value to you since many of you regularly participate. And we're so grateful for the many of our virtual offerings we're, uh, that we are offering are full beyond capacity. Like many other organizations, we are experiencing challenges due to the pandemic. In order to sustain our work, we have added a donation button to our website. To our website. We ask that you donate what you feel is the value of the service to help us continue bringing the very best DEI training to you and to help us fulfill our mission of engaging people, advancing ideas, igniting change. Every donation is fully tax deductible and greatly appreciated. Before I hand things over to Leslie and Cameron, I'd like to share a brief message from our sponsor, Aon. Where will today take you? Where will you take today? Will you step out into who you are, into who you can be? At Aeon, we're committed to helping you be your best and ensuring you experience the best of Aeon. It's your chance to own your potential. A chance to develop professionally through unmatched opportunities and tools to help you succeed. It's your opportunity to work with the best, to learn from and grow with each other. A place where colleagues value one another, where perspectives are embraced and people are celebrated. It's freedom to reach out and make a difference. So clients succeed, so communities grow, so colleagues thrive. This is what it means to work at Aeon. What it feels like when we are at our best. Impact, people, opportunities, and support. This is the Aeon colleague experience. And together, it's how we'll empower results. Thank you so much, Aeon, for your support. And without further ado, I would like to hand things over to Leslie and Cameron. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Leslie's just gonna be sharing her screen. Um, so there we go. There we are. All right, so hi everyone. And thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you also to Ben and everyone at the forum for having us. My name is Cameron Smith. I'm a senior workplace program associate at Tannenbaum. And I'm joined here by my colleague, Leslie Funk, also a Senior Workplace Program Associate at Tannenbaum. Um, and today, as you likely already know, and you can see on the screen here, we'll be discussing the connections between religion, resilience, and mental health during the holiday season. 
Um, that's something we like to refer to as the December dilemma. And to get um, just a little bit of background on Tannenbaum, um, our full name is the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding. So we are a secular, non-sectarian nonprofit that promotes mutual respect um, through practical programs that bridge religious difference and combat religious prejudice. So we do this very different work through four distinct program areas. We have a conflict resolution program, um, and really this is a network um, of religiously motivated peacemakers all operating at the grassroots level in violent conflict, situ in violent conflict situations around the world. Um, we bring them together as a form of support community. Um, our education program, meanwhile, supports K-12 teachers incorporating religious diversity into their classrooms. So that is both with um, lessons and with classroom management. Our healthcare team assists medical professionals with better understanding the value of religio-culturally competent care. So basically what that is, is helping uh, medical practitioners better understand how their patients' beliefs um, could impact the decisions uh, regarding the medical care. And then lastly is our workplace program. Um, as I mentioned, that's where Leslie and I sit. And it's certainly the most pertinent of our programs um, given today's topic and given you know, the work of the forum. We work primarily with our uh, corporate membership program. So we support a network of 40 different corporations all working to address religion and belief as a facet of diversity and inclusion. And I do wanna emphasize that we are secular and non-sectarian, which means that we are not here to promote religion. We're not here to denigrate it. Um, we're really just here because it's a powerful force in people's lives. So to start off here with the learning goals, um, you can see these on the screen. Um, we just want to recognize how religion is present in the workplace, particularly around the holidays. We want to examine the ways holidays and religious diversity can affect mental health in the workplace. Um, and also now that we're working remotely and we want to identify better practices for addressing the December dilemma. And right now we're going to actually, before we get into that first slide, we're gonna be um, launching a poll question. So let me just wait a second for that to launch. All right, so you can see here on your screen, uh, the question asks, where are Americans most likely to interact with folks of a different religion than themselves? So is it the workplace, at school, or in friendship circles? And I would have given it a little more time, but it looks like we have a clear winner here um, in the workplace. So uh, that is correct. Uh, let me go ahead and end the poll. Um, so perhaps not a surprise given the topic of our presentation and also just the reason we're here uh, with the forum. Uh, so the next slide please, Leslie. All right, so um, the answer to this poll question actually comes from a February 2019 report put out by PRRI, the Public Religion Research Institute, and also the Atlantic. So of the respondents who said that they interact with people of religious backgrounds different than their own, it was actually 70% that said that they frequently have these interactions in the workplace. Um, so maybe this is something you've experienced yourself with colleagues or clients. Uh, I was gonna say that it's something that I definitely see in my own workplace, but then again, I kind of thought about that and I work in religious diversity in New York City. So maybe that kind of skews things a bit, um, just a hunch, but um, looking at other settings through which people are exposed to religious diversity, um, we see that 48% responded that they interact with people different, um, with different religions than their own um, in their friend groups. And then we had 14% at civic gatherings. And at Tannenbaum, we've been doing this work now for, uh, for, for years. Um, so I shouldn't say that religious diversity is necessarily a new concept. It is, however, gaining more traction. So studies like these kind of demonstrate the widespread need for this work. And of course, it's not just religion. Um, I should note that the workplace is a setting where a large majority of Americans frequently interact with people of different political and also racial backgrounds. And you can see that on the screen there. I'm hand it over to Leslie. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Cameron. Sorry for the, the slight tech issues here, but thanks for bearing with us. So now we're going to get into what some of the factors are that contribute to the December dilemma. Um, so some of these images on the screen may look familiar, a few different holidays that, uh, a few different movies and holiday portrayals that, that many of us have seen throughout the years. And there's often a lot of um, conversation around if these are 
correct, if they're accurate, is this what different holidays actually look like? A lot of these are, are showing the way that Christmas is celebrated by some folks. So we know that there's a lot of conversation around this already in mainstream media and in, in um, different Hollywood settings. So it's complicated here. So then when we take it back to our own lives in the workplace, we recognize that it's going to be even more complicated there when we're dealing with real people. And one of the aspects, although in, in Hollywood we may see a lot of joyful and, and many happy situations, though I realize we have Home Alone on there and that's not necessarily joyful the whole way through, but um, when we're talking about holidays in our own lives, we I can't talk about that without discussing the stress that can often be associated with this. So that's what we're going to do at this point, discuss a little bit of some of the common causes that are associated with the holiday season. And, and we recognize these are things you may already be familiar with, but we really wanna be clear with uh, setting the, the stage for what we're discussing. So some things that may come up, some uh, causes of stress may be feelings of uh, social isolation. And with all of these, it is especially during COVID. So, so social isolation certainly has taken on a, a new meaning during quarantine times. And while many people are still working from home, grieving the loss of a loved one, similarly not being able to necessarily support one another or be supported during the pandemic, let alone the, the regular anniversaries of people's passing that, that come up or we're reminded of during this time. Increased uh, demands as it comes to social or, or family time and just planning around this. I mean, it's already complicated and then we had a pandemic on top of it. So we want to acknowledge the, the additional stress that is likely coming up around this element and all of these elements at this time of year. Family challenges, we don't need a pandemic for that to be stressful, but it's likely even more stressful at this point. And what are the social expectations around holidays? So for some of us, holiday cheer might just be a nice idea. And in reality, not necessarily associated with our own experiences of this time of year. Um, so it's not always joyful. There can be a lot of these stresses and there can also be mental health challenges, whether that's seasonal affective disorder or other elements um, that are triggered maybe around the holiday season. Um, so when we're talking about this, we also want to bring it to the workplace, right? Or I guess we don't want to necessarily bring all these stresses, but we want to bring the topic to the workplace. And when we're talking about the December dilemma, we'll get into exactly what that is later and, and talk about it a little bit more in depth. But for right now, uh, we use the phrase to mean the, the time during throughout the year, but during the year in particular, it's more than just the month of December, but it's the holiday season that, that we identify as starting with Diwali. So that's October, November, depending on the year, and then going through Lunar New Year, which would be um, January, February, again, depending on the year. So it covers a, a pretty uh, significant uh, length of time. So the December dilemma is more than just this December. And when we're addressing all the things that, or integrating, I should say, all of the things that, that might make us stress outside of work, we can't forget about the things that might be stressful within the workplace or within the remote workplace these days. So some concerns that may come up for people and that we've certainly seen are, are things around securing time off to, to spend time with family or friends. And again, during COVID, it might be a little different, but there might still be that interest in, in um, or that competing interest really between colleagues and trying to get time off. Additionally, trying to figure out and navigate the space of, uh, of appropriate language around greeting colleagues and clients. It's less of uh, just passing each other in the hallway these days for many of us while working from home. So what do we say on Zoom when everyone's watching when it feels like there's a big audience? Scheduling, um, just even within the workplace, how to schedule meetings around whether it's time that people are taking off or projects that need to be done and working around uh, when people are, are observing holidays, when holidays even exist, working on that. And then also we might think that, that workplace decorations around this time of year are a moot point for those of us who are working from home, but many people decorate their homes. And so how will that be affected or how does that affect working from home, what the view is from Zoom, um, and what we're comfortable sharing with our colleagues.
And then, of course, the ultimate one kind of brings it all together, balancing working from home uh, during the holiday season. Can we take the time off that we used to? Is it is it okay? What is What does our company culture say about that? What is the official language around that? Um, and these are all things that, um, again, in a, in a regular uh, holiday season would be challenging. And then furthermore, it's compounded by, uh, by it being a, a pandemic currently. So we can't talk about stress without acknowledging the impact of COVID. And you may think I've already done that. I just keep talking about it with all of the different elements of uh, causes of stress. But we want to be specific in looking at uh, the impact that COVID continues to have on, on our stress levels. And you can see some of the statistics around this. I mean, I think of it in my own life, um, being a, a millennial millennial adult, I think of just being an adult as challenging enough as it is, whether it's um, keeping a job or paying rent or just doing all the things I need to, making sure I'm doing all that stuff, the things that we call adulting often. And adulting is a lot harder in COVID. It is exponentially harder for some people even more than others. Um, and I think this is something that, you know, I say it in jest, but it's also a very serious thing, the impact of COVID on, on people's lives, um, on their not being employed anymore and how this then impacts stress levels, depression, uh, anxiety, all of these elements that, that uh, it doesn't matter what generation you're a part of, it's still a relevant piece of the conversation. And again, when we're talking about the things that people are bringing with them into the workplace or into their meetings or just on their mind, uh, we can't ignore the, the role, the presence of COVID as well. Additionally, we can't talk about stress without talking about the impact of race, especially during the pandemic, especially as this is being, um, as it's being talked about more. We're talking about racial equity. We're talking about the, the ongoing fight for that as well. Um, we've seen that, and many of us have experienced or know that there are various systemic inequalities that negatively affect in particular people of color. And during COVID, we're seeing that there's an added or, or ongoing, in many cases, fear of being the target of xenophobia, anti-Asian bigotry, Islamophobia, or racism. And that's just one element of the things that can be uh, stressful during this time. And certainly as well for Black Americans, there is an increased risk of um, getting COVID, of being predisposed due to uh, higher rates of, of health problems such as hypertension and heart disease that we see predominantly more within the Black American community than we do within any other population around the country. Uh, and then when we look at some of the the more recent data of this year, um, you can see some of it here, but in addition to, to what you see on the screen, from the same survey, the American Psychological Association found that 67% of Black Americans uh, cite discrimination as a significant source of stress in their lives. And this is something that, um, this is a number that held true as of July, and compared to just two months prior in May, when the number was 55%, significant increase. And that might seem obvious to, to some, but being able to quantify it provides an interesting, um, interesting element to the conversation. And we see even more beyond uh, the Black American population, we see that adults, broadly speaking, across populations, 60% of, of these adults say that police violence towards minorities is a significant source of stress. So again, when we're talking about all the different elements that are stressful in our lives, in the lives of our neighbors, colleagues, colleagues, um, everyone <laughs> who exists, it seems, there's so many different things to consider. And so when we're encouraging folks to bring their whole selves to work, ideally we mean that for the positive things because there's so many different great aspects of, of humans that, that we can all bring in our diverse lived experiences to the workplace, to engaging with one another. And we also have to consider all the different challenges that come along with um, with those lived experiences that may be problematic to have on, on one's mind when trying to just get through the day. Turn it back over to Cameron. Yeah, thank you. So continuing right along with our objectives, uh, we're gonna be examining the role religion plays in mental health and how this is a workplace issue. All right, so we have another poll question for you. Um, this time there's no correct answer. We just want your thoughts. We just wanna see where you stand on this. So I'll give that a second to pop up. Um, but the question is, 
at work and in your personal communities, how do you feel is the attitude towards mental health support? Is it open and welcoming in the process of becoming more open? Maybe we don't talk about it, so we're not sure. Um, or maybe there's even negative stigma still associated with it. So it looks like this one is maybe a little bit more contentious than the last, so I'll give it a couple more seconds. Right, so we're kind of vacillating between open and welcome, uh, welcoming and in the process of more becoming more open. So that's certainly encouraging. Um, yeah, not too many at the bottom right now, although still a significant amount. All right, so that's, I think largely that's encouraging. Right, so let me just end this poll. Sorry, thanks for bearing with us on this. Um, and if Leslie, if you can just load all of those, I think that would be helpful. Sorry, Leslie's the one in control when there's two of us here. So there might be a more tech savvy way of navigating this, but we didn't figure it out. Um, but to start off with, um, I wanna ask why we're even talking about religion and mental health together in this way. Um, and that's because mental health is a holiday season issue, kind of just like Leslie just explained, but it's also a workplace issue. So the prevalence of mental health struggles definitely has a noticeable impact on the bottom line. So according to the WHO or the World Health Organization, depression is actually a leading cause of disability worldwide. Depression and anxiety or, uh, disorders cost the global economy an estimated $1 trillion uh, a year in lost productivity. So that's trillion with a T. Um, an estimated 20% of the adult working population struggles with mental health issues at any given time. And in the US, an estimated 200 million days are lost from work each year because of depression. So we can hit the next slide, please. All right, so generally speaking, um, there is still social stigma, stigma um, attached to discussing mental health issues. And we kind of saw that reflect a little bit in the poll that we just had. Um, and that, of course, can make having a conversation about it more difficult. And at Tannenbaum, we encourage everyone to have these difficult conversations. Um, within and across different religious communities, there is a wide range of approaches to addressing mental health and to seeking mental health help. So there's often this mis uh, misconception about religion, um, about religion in relation to psychological or psychiatric resources. Um, they're seen as being in conflict with one another or maybe incompatible with one another, but that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. So next slide, please. Religion and belief is um, often a source of resilience for many people. And you can see on the screen how we think about that in the context of religion and belief particularly, um, or specifically rather. Um, so resilience is both about the personal and the community. So incorporating both self-care and community healing. And we recognize that religious diversity and inclusion in the workplace is more about, more than just representation. Um, it's actually a resource for the employees and for the company itself. So Leslie had highlighted some of the additional stressors that will be at the forefront of people's minds um, in this, during this particular holiday season, um, such as the pandemic, such as racial justice. And I think that the last bullet point on here, um, the last bullet point on the screen, excuse me, um, provides a great example, albeit from just one faith tradition in particular. Um, so it's a great example of how religion can inspire resilience, um, but also the intersectional nature of religion and belief. Next slide, please. Okay, so recognizing that religion and belief are sources of strength and resilience for individuals, it's important to recognize then um, how observance and community look different in the age of COVID. So as I'm sure everyone's familiar with, people have had to scale back attendance at religious services, if not go completely virtual, and just generally find new ways to engage. Um, so the first wave of COVID, um, as I'm sure you guys remember, actually coincided with the spring holiday season. And we saw a bunch of different traditions adapt their celebrations and observances accordingly. So religious communities and individuals alike will need to, again, alter their celebrations and observances as we're stepping into this new holiday season. And while I did just recognize that the ways in which religion um, can be a source of strength and resilience, it is important to note that everyone has a different relationship with their religions and their belief systems, and we can't paint with too broad of a brush um, when speaking about these issues. So just as religion might be a source of strength and resilience for some people, um, these added complement excuse me, added complications can contribute to a sense of uncertainty and sort of compound the feelings of stress associated with this year's holiday season. So while we do want to be positive and, you know, posit that this can be a source of strength for people, um, you know, everyone's different, everyone interprets things differently, and we want to be mindful of that duality. All right, so um, before we move on, we do have another poll 
Um, this one, uh, just like the last one, there is no right answer. We just want to get a better understanding of where you guys are at. So I'll wait for that to come up, but the question then, ah, Benzo is on top of it. Um, what role have you seen religious or non-religious beliefs and practices play in maintaining or improving mental health? Um, so is it an additional supportive resource for people, separate and apart from people's mental health, um, or lastly, in contradiction to mental health needs? All right, and again, um, like the first time around, it looks like the first option of a lot of respondents here agreeing with that. That is an additional supportive resource for people. And again, that's also, that's great to see. All right, so it looks like it's kind of fluctuating there at 69%, 70%. So let me just end this poll and then move on. Okay, so now we're going to get into more about um, some of the ways in which holidays are, are showing up and how it can be addressed in the workplace. So an element still of the holiday season in, in um, maybe different ways than we have ever thought about it, uh, it does involve celebrating um, or the possibility of celebrating, we should say. And what that might look like this year is quite different rather than the in-person, sometimes awkward holiday parties, there are some other options that might be engaged in, especially for workplaces that are, are primarily remote at this time. So some of the ideas may include virtual games like trivia or scavenger hunt. Um, it may involve having an outside speaker come to kind of pump up the team and, and get everyone excited or, or boost morale overall during an otherwise challenging time of year. You might bring back the ugly holiday sweaters and whether that's just for a team meeting or for a full day, depending on what's uh, maybe appropriate for your workplace, it could be something that, that you could keep going and, and keep something that some people like and appreciate. You could also send uh, boxes or recipes to colleagues, depending, of course, on if this is feasible with budgets, knowing that that can be difficult uh, for some places, but it might be a nice little way to, to share um, a little bit of joy this season. And it could actually just even be done via email. Sharing recipes doesn't have to, to cost anything. There's the whole baking fad that I've certainly jumped on the bandwagon of. So maybe that will be of interest to, to folks in a way that it, it hasn't previously been. Celebrating a day of wellness, um, whatever that might look like. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to do that, whether it's around meditation or um, emphasizing self-care in its many different forms, different activities to do remotely or in person. Coordinating a secret snowflake. This might be more familiarly known as Secret Santa, but we're keeping it uh, open. Secret snowflake, doing something like that, sending uh, treats to people. A lot of different creative options within there. Volunteering remotely together. This might be a possibility. Um, or hosting a virtual holiday party. Uh, and there's the possibility of a talent show. These are just some ideas to, to get folks thinking about ways in which to be creative, to, to still come together as a team. I know that's not a, always a, 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 a preferred um, method of observing the holidays, being required to attend a work function. But perhaps if it's voluntary, any of these things could be voluntary and people might be more interested in being a part of it. I'm, I'm someone who likes team building activities. I know it's like no one likes those things, but I think they can be fun. Um, but if I'm required to attend, that, that changes everything. So consider what you can do and consider how you communicate about that option uh, for staff. And so here's where we talk a little bit more specifically about the December dilemma time period. So I mentioned starts with Diwali and ends with Lunar New Year. And again, this is the way Tannenbaum talks about it. And it's not necessarily the only way to speak about it. We just want to be clear that there are more holidays going on than the, the typical, I think, trifecta that's thought of with Christmas, Kwanzaa, and Hanukkah. There's a lot of other holidays going on. This is also not an exclusive list. There are many others that are out there, but these are some of the ones that fall within that time period. And again, it's a lot of this is about increasing awareness and sharing with folks that this, that this is the case. And when we talk about holidays, although today we're focused on the December dilemma and this very specific multi-month uh, time period, we also do want to, to be clear that it's not that stress only comes around this time of year. Again, even during a non-pandemic year, holidays throughout the year might unfortunately also be causes of stress. And for many of the same reasons or similar reasons that this time of year might be stressful, whether it's with um, obligations to family or friends, dealing with traveling or, um, 
well, COVID issues around traveling, feeling, uh, feelings of self, sorry, feelings of social isolation or just general uh, social expectations overall. And with holidays um, like Ramadan or Yom Kippur or other holidays that involve fasting, there can be some, uh, some added uh, challenges for some folks depending on their relationship with food. So, you know, there's a lot to consider and that can feel overwhelming. You know, we each have our own experiences to, to get through sometimes as well. But considering the many different places in which people are coming from, again, when they're showing up at work, when they're showing up to a meeting, um, there's a lot of different things going on in, in it that's possibly going on in everyone's lives. And our hope in sharing this information with you is to, again, increase awareness, increase that um, knowledge of what might be going on and consider how that can be helpful to you and your colleagues as you're approaching this time of year and as you're thinking about the impact of holidays throughout the year. Some of those other holidays and, and others in quotes because we know that it's not, we're not referring to, to holidays as others, just those that are falling outside of the, the December dilemma time period. So I want to be clear on that. I'm not trying to other anyone or put people in an out group, but we acknowledge that these are some, again, some of the holidays that happen throughout the year, just a, a variety of possibilities. And again, I know this can seem overwhelming and, and can be uh, a cause to prevent people from addressing religious diversity or, or um, the, the concept, the topic of faith or religion in the workplace. But we're not bringing this up to say these are all the days that you can't do things, but we're bringing this up to say with increased awareness and knowledge about these holidays and others, you can actually be more um, considerate and ultimately be more informed when engaging with folks to say today is uh, perhaps um, to Bishvat or Holi, and I know that this day is of significance to some folks. If it's problematic for scheduling, please let me know. And, and really just communicating. A lot has to do with transparency and recognizing that, that you know or your company knows that these days may be significant and relevant for scheduling purposes to people. So again, some more holidays through the second half of the year, and these are all dates for um, 2021. Okay, and back to Cameron. All right, so moving right along, we want to identify better practices for addressing the December dilemma. All right, so um, if you can load all of these, please. Sorry, I should have fixed that myself. <laughs> um, so this first tip uh, might seem pretty basic, um, but we've listed a few holiday greetings for reference on the screen here. Um, so kind of taking the time to learn something new or show interest in someone's holiday, um, thinking about how that can go a long way. And this is something that actually surprised me when I joined Tannenbaum. Um, just how often people felt unseen or un unacknowledged because it actually is so rare that their coworkers did something as simple as learn a greeting or ask about a holiday. So it is appropriate to ask a coworker, you know, what holiday greeting they prefer or if they're celebrating any particular holiday, any practices you need to be aware of, as long as the questions are respectful and come from a place of genuine curiosity. So definitely don't be afraid to ask respectful questions of your colleagues. Um, this is one of the best ways to avoid misunderstandings, uh, to create a more inclusive environment more generally. And just a note about the inclusion of Ramadan, because I feel like that might be a question. Um, we know that it's not coming up um, in the remainder of 2020, the calendar year, but um, because it does follow a lunar calendar, um, it will at some point soon um, be a holiday that falls into this traditional December dilemma timeframe that we're talking about. Um, so the next slide, please. All right. Um, yeah, there you go. You know what I was going to ask. <laughs> um, so an additional piece of the sort of low hanging fruit when it comes to addressing religious diversity and inclusion and specifically the December dilemma is consulting interfaith calendars. And I should note that this is a practice that should be employed year round, um, but it's particularly helpful during this time of year. So on the screen, there are three different interfaith calendars that Tannenbaum recommends. Um, and at Tannenbaum, we don't have our own interfaith calendar just because there are these existing resources that we think are super comprehensive, very user friendly, and we're just kind of happy not to try and recreate the wheel. Um, but I think in combination, all of these offer something different and they really offer a great package of resources for you all to consult. Um, and this is something that should be done in person, um, in, person uh, in person at meetings, at different events, both informal and formal. Um, but it's also important to keep up with this practice as many of us are working remotely. Um, remote work has a lot of benefits for sure, um, but we should recognize that religious commitments and holiday stress uh, aren't reduced just because someone is working from home. 
and I can't speak for everybody, but speaking for myself at least, I find that it's sometimes more difficult to keep that work stuff and that personal stuff from blending together. Um, so while we're definitely working from home, um, we have to kind of be careful sometimes and think that we could also be living at work. Um, it probably sounds more dramatic than it is, but I think Drake, you get the point. Um, all of that to say that sensitive scheduling is something that can reduce employee stress and just minimize unnecessary conflicts. And you know that of course can ultimately expand attendance at events and just generally increase, increase appreciation uh, for inclusion efforts. So as always, referencing these calendars um, isn't a replacement for respectfully asking colleagues about their schedules um, and their observances, but something to supplement that. Uh, next slide, please. So um, you might be picking up on a theme of respect. And these are tips on the screen, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the tips on the screen. Uh, these are Tannenbaum's competencies for respectful communication. And we think that they're just a great place to start when figuring out how to approach conversations about religion, uh, religious practice, and even topics like stress and mental health that we've been talking a little bit about here. So I don't want to belabor any of these points, but I think it's worth walking through them real quickly. Um, so the first one is avoid assumptions. So, you know, don't assume that you know the whole situation without learning more. Um, maybe your evangelical Christian colleague is actually a passionate LGBTQ ally um, because, you know, his child actually identifies as non-binary. Um, and that's actually something we've seen. So um, you want to also avoid spokesperson syndrome, use I. It can be awkward to have to kind of speak for a whole group of diverse people. So we think it's just to, uh, best to avoid asking people to speak on behalf of, say, all Jewish people, all Christian people, whatever the case may be. Instead, just speak and ask about people's personal experiences. The platinum rule, um, you've probably all heard of the golden rule, you know, treat others how you want to be treated. Um, but at Tannenbaum, we try to push it a little further and uh, keep the platinum rule in mind. So that's just treat others the way that they want to be treated. And of course, the only way to know is to ask. Um, be curious and ask respectfully. So, um, you know, genuine curiosity can definitely go a long way, um, and as does thinking before we speak. So, um, you know, for example, uh, if you know of a South Asian client or employee that has an upcoming wedding, um, you might ask about how the couple met rather than, you know, wasn't an arranged marriage. Word choice matters in this case. Um, and of course, listen actively. You know, it's great to ask respectful questions, but you want to take the time to listen actively and understand what's being said. Um, identify and debunk stereotypes. So when you hear someone make a broad generalization about um, an identity or a group of people and you know that not to be true, then you know, just speak up um, and share what you know. Address behavior, not belief. Um, you know, we at Tannenbaum are not here to tell you what to believe. Um, your workplace should not be telling you what to believe. Um, I, don't, I personally don't want to. I think that sounds exhausting. I don't want to have that conversation. Um, but the workplace can set parameters around behavior um, and the ways in which we all treat one another. Um, encourage learning. So we can't know everything all the time. Uh, so when possible and when appropriate, just encourage and promote educational opportunities. And acknowledge and apologize for mistakes made. We are all human. We're all going to make mistakes. That's to be expected. Um, but it's important to acknowledge when we've actually made mistakes and own up to it and apologize and work on being better. Hand that back to Les. Great. So actually, before I get into the content on this slide, if we could put up the last poll. And while Ben's pulling that up, it, the question is, now you can see it, what strategies and tools do you use to cope with stress during the holiday season? And as with the others, there is no right answer and we'd love for you to pick all the ones that apply to you. So the options include connect with family and friends, speak with a mental health professional, turn to my religion, faith, or spiritual beliefs, take time for myself, or maybe something else that isn't listed. A lot of activity, which is really great to see. Thank you all for engaging with these polls. It seems like take time for myself is a, is a big one. Um, and connecting with family or friends is, is a pretty um, popular option as well. Less people do something that's not included on here or speak with a mental health professional. And some people, kind of a small majority here, turn to their religion, faith, or spiritual beliefs. On the poll, and you can see, yeah, take time for myself is a, is a clear winner. Um, yeah, so it's interesting to see what works for people because not just with the poll, but with, with all of this, there's no, um, there's no one right answer. 
And I think that's important to consider. Doing what works for you is ultimately what's what's best to do, which can make it more challenging, of course, um, but also important to consider resources out there and, and trying different things. And so some of the resources that, that we would advise folks to look into, especially, again, when thinking about how this comes into play in the workplace, are some of the ones that are listed here on the slide. So the Mayo Clinic um, has well, I should say all of these are articles, so you can actually Google all of them to, to look up their resources. And the last one is a different Tannenbaum specific resource. We have a fact sheet, as we call it, kind of a, a one to two pager. This one I think is a little bit longer, but about the December dilemma, a, a longer uh, document that allows you to, to look at some of the options, what some of the holidays are to share. We definitely encourage folks to share this and the other fact sheets about different holidays that are on our website. Um, and so you can go to our website look in our workplace section and workplace resources are, are where you'll find this fact sheet and other holiday fact sheets as well. So ultimately, at the end of the day, we do have some takeaways for you in addition to those resources themselves. Um, we, we think it's a, an important consideration to engage in better practices around scheduling and appropriate greetings with the information Cameron shared earlier. Ultimately, a lot of it comes down to that respectful questioning, which may seem simple and, and you know, maybe you don't need presenters to, to share that with you, but they can be really good reminders around this time of year when there's so much else going on. So referencing or, or just sneaking a peek at the fact sheets or Googling online to trusted resources can be really helpful in order to, to proceed um, with consideration around scheduling and appropriate greetings and practice all of those elements of respectful communication. That's another resource that's available on our website. And again, it can be nice to have those reminders. It's not, it's not rocket science, but it is, um, we have been told that it is helpful to be reminded of this information. So consider uh, keeping them in mind, using those I statements, addressing behavior, not belief, all of those elements can be really helpful to, to keep in mind when everything feels more hard, more difficult than usual. Sharing existing resources, I may sound like a broken record at this point um, because I know I just mentioned the importance of sharing resources on the previous slide, but it is that important that it's worth saying again. And yes, we are tooting our own horn about Tannenbaum's fact sheets, but they, they can be incredibly helpful, um, especially having an outside party's resources, not saying, I want you to know about my holiday, but oh, hey, my holiday is coming up. Here's some information to share with colleagues. So it might feel more accessible um, to, to share this information within your company and, and with your colleagues. And consider how existing uh, groups and communities within your company can also help to support each other and, and one another. Uh, the employee resource groups that you have in place, whether that's a faith-based one or mental health or a women's group, any sort of group that exists already, may actually be able to use these resources and integrate them into even just sharing with a mailing list. Um, but but using, can use this information in order to support one another. And that might be a helpful way to communicate with specific uh, communities or with the, the company-wide community as a whole. And reaching out to colleagues. This may take a different form remotely, a virtual coffee uh, meetup rather than in person, um, but it can be really powerful, especially when social isolation is an increasing concern during COVID, during this holiday season. Um, so I encourage you to reach out to colleagues within your company, at previous companies, folks that, that you'd love to get to know better um, or maybe commiserate with, whatever it is, it, it can be a helpful thing to connect with other people. And that is our presentation. So we're going to take a look at some of the questions that have been submitted and answer them now. If you do have more questions to, uh, that you'd like us to answer, feel free to submit them in the Q&A and we will um, take a look at them. And also feel free to be in touch with us uh, via email or on the social media channels that are listed here. And kind of following up on that social media, um, our comms team would be um, quite upset if I didn't plug that. Um, I know you have the, the information here, but um, we're at the Tannenbaum, at Tannenbaum Center on Twitter and Instagram, and on Facebook and LinkedIn, you can find us by the organization's full name, the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding. Um, but yeah, it does look like some questions have come in. 
Um, so the first one that I see here is, does religious diversity include non-believers? Yes. Um, and I apologize for not being more explicit about that. Um, when we do this work and we uh, speak about the way it should be communicated in workplaces, we always stress um, the inclusion of people of all faiths and none. Um, we talk a lot about the unaffiliated population um, and that in itself is a diverse group. In the US right now, I believe 25% of the, the adult population identifies as a member of that unaffiliated category. So that does include atheists, agnostics, um, but also people that um, report uh, having a belief in God, um, connecting to spirituality, um, praying regularly, um, just not being affiliated formally with a religious institution. So um, you might be more familiar with the term nuns um, when that was first identified by Pew, I think like 2012. Um, so we don't mean to other anybody um, or define people what they are not, but re instead recognize that, yes, that is a large segment of the population um, with a bunch of diverse traditions. So um, even when we're talking about holidays, uh, something like Christmas, it is a religious holiday, but at the same time, it has become such a cultural uh, holiday and event as well um, that we recognize that it's celebrated by a ton of people, not just Christians. Um, I can follow up with uh, another Pew report on that if that would be of interest. Um, and also when we talk about holidays and days of significance and observance, um, that is meant to include people um, without any sort of formal uh, faith identification, um, whether it's an anniversary, um, perhaps um, observing the death, uh, the anniversary of a death, uh, things like that. Anything to add, Leslie? Sorry. No, no, you covered it. And I'm glad we, I'm glad it was mentioned and that we were able to, to speak specifically about including people who might be uh, unaffiliated. So thank you to the person who asked us. Definitely. All right, so the next one, uh, the next question says, I work at a two-year college and it is common for there to be only Christmas decorations around and no other decorations acknowledging the holidays. Um, do you have any tips for how I can help my little college be more inclusive? we do still have on-campus learning and working. That's great. Yeah, I th this is a really common question that we get around this time of year. Um, it could be a, a multinational corporation or uh, a little college, as I think this, this person referred to their space. And, and there's no one size fits all answer, um, as with so much of this content. But I think a, a first step might be to talk to HR and to, to ask them if they've thought about it. Because often what we find is that it's not always it's not always something that's been considered or there's concern about, well, if we acknowledge other holidays, then we have to acknowledge all holidays. So even just getting the conversation going can be a, a pretty helpful helpful um, thing to do. And what we encourage in those cases when there are concerns about having to acknowledge you know, the, the innumerable number of, of religious traditions that might be present at that time of year, um, we encourage including little um, not necessarily the full fact sheet, but information near the additional um, holiday decorations, whether that's a menorah, a canara, or something additional, and just explaining what it is, why it's there. So, so giving people the opportunity to learn from uh, those additional decorations. Um, and this looks different at different places, especially it sounds like with this space, the, the college probably owns the space, but with companies that are present in a building and there's a shared lobby, it might be a different type of conversation. But I, I think just inquiring uh, within the HR department to, to see what, uh, what's been discussed, if it has been discussed at all, that might be a, a great starting point. Cameron, I don't know if you have other things to add. No, I totally agree. Um, I think the only other thing is if you are aware of how decorations should be displayed or if you see something displayed incorrectly um, that any of you feel comfortable it'd be great to serve as a resource yourself um, because you know despite people's best intentions sometimes we get it wrong um, if you see that the menorah is kind of put in like a closed hallway or on the floor um, you know somewhere that's not able to kind of shine its light um, given its intended purpose then you know mention that kindly it's an educational opportunity but yeah thank you for bringing up this question Okay, the next question is, what are your thoughts on developing chaplaincy programs, um, non-denominational non programs? Um, yeah, I, I think everything depends on the company culture um, and companies are each at different points in this journey. That's sort of how we articulate it. Um, some people are only just beginning to address this while others are more, uh, more advanced. Um, 
depending on what resources and the setup that you have, the business function as well, if it's not just corporate offices, if it's, you know, maybe factory settings or um, line workers, it definitely could be, um, it could definitely be useful. Um, something I would point, not to shamelessly plug our social media further, but I would point you to our YouTube page um, back in the spring when everyone, uh, or a lot of people started working remotely. Um, we tried to transition our online summit into um, shorter, YouTube uh, panel discussions, hour-long panel discussions with our CEO, Mark Fowler. And one of the first ones that we did was with Karen Diefendorf, who is the head of chaplaincy services, services at Tyson. Um, and they spoke about the, spoke at length about the utility of uh, a chaplaincy program. So if you, that's something you want to learn more about, um, definitely check out our YouTube page and that video is available. Um, so the next question is, the biggest problem I experience is how to respond to Merry Christmas when you are not Christian or how to express season's greetings when you know the other individual is not Christian, but how, uh, sorry, but you are unsure of their beliefs. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, and it's tough. I mean, I'm thinking, so I identify as Jewish and I don't celebrate Christmas. Um, and every year I kind of go through the, how do I feel about Christmas this year? Um, conversation with myself and it changes. And sometimes I feel more bitter about about it um, than not just being a part of a, an outside group. But that's not what's being asked. I, I just bring that up to say that I can relate to the challenge of that and the challenge of being the, the receiver. Because I think what's sometimes most important is to understand that if it's with goodwill, if someone is wishing me or, or a colleague Merry Christmas or season's greeting with goodwill, then I appreciate the sentiment. It's a nice idea in the grand scheme of things. And that that is an important thing to recognize. Um, that being said, if it's someone who you know, or if you're in a managerial position, perhaps, you might be able to convey to the person or to, to your team as well, that there are different ways to celebrate and what works for, for you or, you know, what works for me is to say happy holidays. Um, and it's not intended to shame anyone. And I think that can be the, the tricky part of to communicate that there are different ways to express joy or express um, goodwill during the holiday season. And people have different ways of doing so. And I think we see this play out um, beyond conversations around DEI, just, just in general. I think this can be a contentious topic, but I, a big part of it is going back to what we spoke about before, respectful communication and owning if you make a mistake or if someone expresses that they're upset by what you said, or maybe you know, choosing how you respond to someone else and saying, you know, this, this doesn't work for me, but what I would love is um, happy holidays or what I would appreciate is acknowledgement of what I celebrate, um, whatever holiday that may be. Uh, so again, no one size fits all sort of response, but consider the relationships you, excuse me, that you have with people and consider what feels uh, most appropriate and comfortable for that interaction. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so the next question uh, says, we are presently examining being supportive of our staff's beliefs and values driven from their faith while balancing values and beliefs of our agency. Um, do you have guidance and resources regarding this? For example, how agency serves LGBTQ plus families, children, and youth. Um, yeah, sorry, this is like a un unintentionally, I'm sure, a loaded question because I'm trying to think about how to go about this without sort of... Uh, shamelessly promoting our, our own services. Um, but I think to an extent, um, sort of striking that balance between um, faith and policy um, goes back to what I mentioned before about belief versus behavior. Um, like I said, you know, um, everyone is free to believe what they want um, and the workplace is not an institution that be, should be striving to change that. Um, but we, you know, the workplace can set guidelines around behavior and how we conduct ourselves, how we treat one another. Um, and I think, you know, it is possible to balance those two. Um, uh, at Tannenbaum, we do work on um, anti-harassment policies and anti-proselytizing policies. Um, but we also do try to uh, highlight, recognize and highlight um, the intersectional nature of religion, um, particularly with the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, you know, the two identities are not mutually exclusive from one another. There are plenty of people that identify as a person of faith. Um, or a religious person and a member of the LGBTQ plus community. So um, I hope that answers your question in a more roundabout way, but um, Leslie, do you have anything to add? 
I would just add the importance of, of transparent communication around this. So being clear with, with colleagues with the company about the purpose of asking for this information about faith and belief and why it's being asked for and what it's being used for so that it's not necessarily to um, incorporate people's religious beliefs into the way that the company runs, but to ensure that there's increased awareness of um, holidays maybe or days of significance to folks so that there is there aren't misconstrued assumptions about what will happen next and maybe also to reiterate what the company values are around respect around appropriate and appropriate interaction so um, there's always the possibility that there could be confusion or misunderstanding but doing what what a company can do to mitigate that uh, would be my additional piece so the next question, um, does Tannenbaum do virtual or face-to-face -face workshop trainings for college students who are studying leadership in the workplace? Um, so <laughs> we've, we've worked with uh, college students before. Um, I think a lot of the trainings that we have um, could be applied to, um, to, the, to college students and people that are you know, soon to be members of the workforce. Um, Tannenbaum does also have an education program that I mentioned before. Um, so while it is K to 12, I, I do think that there might be some interesting resources there, um, just providing that overlap between our workplace program and our education program. Um, but yes, that is, I think, something we could do. And if you're interested, uh, feel free to shoot us an email. Okay, uh, next question. What is a good way to assume, uh, I'm sorry, what is a good way to ask someone if they celebrate a holiday without assuming they celebrate a holiday? Yeah, so I think, um, but just a kind of just phrasing it respectfully, um, you know, everyone, you can never really know for sure how someone will interpret something, but I think having that good respectful intention on your end is most important. Um, and like we had mentioned before, uh, sort of owning a mistake or apologizing if it is re uh, received in a way that you did not intend. Um, but I think maybe just sort of work things in conversation as well. Um, if, you know, you're talking to a colleague and you know that you have time off um, because you know there's an upcoming holiday that's officially recognized um, by the employer. You can ask, you know, what are you doing on that day? Are you doing anything special? Um, it doesn't have to be um, like a formal conversation. It could be, you know, just casual and informal. It's another way to get to know someone. And I would say an alternative approach, which I guess is a little bit more formal, would be to say, "Hey, I don't want to be offensive," or "Hey, I, I'm." not sure if this is the right way to ask, but I do want to be considerate if you are celebrating or if this is important to you. So I, I also, <laughs> I think I sound like a broken record at this point, just communicate, communicate, but, but there's a reason for that. And again, it could be uh, misconstrued or it could be, um, you might come across in a way that you didn't intend, but trying to be clear about why you're asking, um, it can be helpful. So, um... This might be the last question looking at the time, um, but understanding various practices, how can I increase the conversation without offending anyone? Um, so I think the value of addressing religion and belief is that when we look at specific policies and practices, they are broadly applicable to people of all faiths and none. Um, so to give an example of that, um, what sensitive scheduling, that's something I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, but when you are mindful of when you're scheduling, say, maybe um, a Friday after work event, um, is to someone who is Muslim, um, would they need to go to uh, go pray at, after work um, on a Friday? And would that preclude them from attending? Um, at the same time, your Jewish colleague, um, you know, might be observing the Sabbath and again is not able to attend. Um, perhaps the meeting or the, the gathering place was at a bar. Um, is that appropriate for someone that's Mormon? Um, and then going back to that, um, people of all faiths and none. Um, perhaps a person on your team um, is, you know, newly sober or um, trying to maintain their sobriety. And, you know, is, is that happy hour the best place for that person either? So um, it's sort of these questions and these practices that are broadly applicable. And I think then create the space for people to speak more openly about their needs. Do you have anything to add? <laughs> no, that's great. I I think it's important to consider the creative options that people can take. It's not, now you have to do everything different or, or speak in a very different way, but consider some alternatives. Consider being creative about approaching different things to attract new people or um, to show the, the welcoming approach towards inclusivity that maybe you've put words towards, but maybe people haven't felt. 
Wonderful. Thank you both so much. On that note, unfortunately, yes, we do have to end this, uh, the Q&A at this time. Um, I just want to thank both um, Cameron and Leslie so much for this wonderful webinar. And thank you, everyone who participated. A special thank you to our webinar sponsor, Aeon. As promised, the SHRM activity ID for the session is 20-7CMCG and the HRC activity ID is 537023. Those have both been entered into the chat by my colleague, Ernest. Um, if you'd like to continue the conversation and learn more, please feel free to contact um, Cameron and Leslie um, at Cameron at csmith at tenenbaum.org and Leslie at lfunk at tenenbaum.org. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Please join us for our November webinar, Harnessing the Power of Resistance Transformative Leadership Strategies with presenters Dr. Christopher Sansone and Maria Velasco. On Thursday, November 19th at 11 a.m. Central, Stand Central Standard Time. Uh, new episodes of the Forum podcast are now also available. Visit forumworkplaceinclusion.org, forward class podcast. Speaking of podcasts, we will be doing a follow-up podcast with today's presenters, Cameron and Leslie, to answer some of the questions that we weren't able to get to um, today, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and the forum podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Anchor. Thank you again for joining us. We look forward to having you join us for future webinars. Have a great day.